Hello, you guys. It is the third day of February. I know y'all probably thought I forgot, but I did. It's just been a busy day. Um, but the third day of February, I want to focus on um, anti-slavery newsletters, abolitionist newsletters, but really um, whatever you want to call them. These are Black publications that were around in the 19th century. <clears throat> and one of the oldest ones I want to talk about is The Liberator. It dates back to 1831, I believe. And it was printed out of Boston. So um, yeah, if you don't know, check it out. It was published, um, printed and published in Boston, Massachusetts by William Lloyd Garrison. Um, and then through 1839 by Isaac Knapp. The difference between like the, and you guys probably know more about the North Star um, and the North Star. Most people know the North Star. Um, <clears throat> that was, that didn't start until 1851. And that the North Star was published by Frederick Douglass. So I'll get more into that. But, um, you know, of course, the North Star was very anti-slavery, you know, that kind of stuff. Whereas the, the Liberator appealed more to, um, was considered as a moral conscious of its readers, very religious in its context and, and different things. But I really wanted to bring this to your, um, you know, just kind of give you some understanding about, you know, early publications, you know, especially when we start talking about abol um, abolitionists and, you know, a lot of the things that were reported. <clears throat> so um, a lot of the pub black publications that we have today really owe it to um, these uh, these earlier publications again we're talking about the liberator it was a weekly newsletter or newspaper excuse me at the time um and uh, william lloyd garrison printed this um this newspaper for i think it said 35 years so that's pretty that's a fairly long time and um excuse me and um it had a circulation of about 3,000, and that seemed pretty small, but um, you have to consider the reach of that of, of that publication. So if it only has a circulation of 3,000, to me, that's pretty significant. We're talking about 1831 for 35 years. To me, that's pretty significant because you have to look beyond just the, the circulation reach and to see who, you know, how far does it extend? How far does it go? Who Who's catching those stories and sharing those stories with other people? That's the power of journalism. That's the power of your voice in print. And so um, it was really big. The Liberator was big, of course, on advocacy. Like I said, it took more of a religious kind of moral, more perspective as it related to, you know, uh, ab uh, abolishing slavery. Again, this was printed. Uh, this was in Boston, Massachusetts, and um, you know that's that's kind of really the direction that Garrison took um, <clears throat> as it relates to the Liberator and his weekly newspaper. Again, the the Liberator was printed in Boston, Massachusetts for thirty five years. Is it it was from January? It's first published January first, eighteen thirty one. So um, yeah, so pretty interesting uh, information. So when we start looking at a lot of, of the African-American, Black, whatever term you want to use, publications of today, we owe it to look at some previous um, publications that, that you know, kind of pioneered the way. Now, a lot of people know about the North Star, Frederick Douglass. There's been a resurgence lately. I believe Jesse Williams <clears throat> and a few others are uh, kind of uh, bringing the North Star back. And this is, if you don't know about it, I'm telling you about it today. The North Star is an American newspaper, and it was, again, published by Frederick Douglas. The first, um, it was the first issue, as you could say, was December 3rd, 1847. Um, and so Frederick Douglass, uh, I went to a 
um, exhibit about him <clears throat> when we were in Boston, Massachusetts was amazing because he is the most probably, if, if not um, the most um, photographed or his image is the most that they've ever seen of any African American, um, especially during that time, and it was amazing. Of uh, it was just telling the history, his history, how many times he'd been photographed, and just all of the different places that he'd been, and how much he wrote and spoke, and just so much. And um, so I encourage you, if you're in the Boston, Massachusetts area, if you ever visit, you need to go and just um, it's just. It's just phenomenal. Again, just it's on the Freedom Trail. It's just that museum on the Freedom Trail. It's just phenomenal. Um, and but in it, you know, you learn about the North Star, and you actually they have the press, like the 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 press that he used um, for the North Star. Is um, it's just I'm a history person, so it was phenomenal. But again, um, so he used money that he earned speaking in Great Britain and Ireland. He did go on speaking tours. So speaking circuits are nothing new. This has been going on for like ever. <laughs> so, um, but it went on to be a very influential uh, newspaper or publication. And um, the North Star, whereas the Liberator was uh, published in, uh, out of Boston, the North Star was published out of Rochester, New York. Um, so, it, excuse me, the motto of the North Star was right is of no sex, truth is of no color, God is the father of us all, and we are brethren. So, um, and you can you can really kind of feel the passion behind that and, and how relevant that is even to today. And um, so I, I, I love that there's a resurgence of this. I think that, you know, it's, it's not only going to influence, you know, the conscious mind of the African-American community, but I think it would kind of help get some of the journalism that, we, that we're seeing back on track and put some credibility and some passion and some um, content, <laughs> relevant and important content back into uh, publication and back into you know journalism and um so you you know it's if while uh, some of this stuff of course is editorial in nature it's the passion and the heart and what you get behind um uh, what went into it so again you start talking about abolitionists and you know how they wrote and what they were talking about and just sharing that it was just pioneering and again open the opportunity away if you do a google search of african-american publications you will see all kinds of stuff um you know from then and now but it doesn't really go into the 1800s until you specifically look for certain things there are some that you know you'll see stuff from 1947 but i specifically wanted to go back to the 1800s because i really felt that to understand where we are today again how can you grow from the past if you don't know what's in your past and so understanding that where black journalism was back in the 1800s and the importance of the african-american voice and and how these people gave voice to our communities is just really relevant and um um <clears throat> if you don't know by the way william lloyd garrison was not an african-american man he was a black man but he wrote um, about african-american issues Sp specifically he was very anti-slavery and so um one of the things that douglas uh wrote said because you're talking about people might watch this and say well how can he talk about the liberated north star at the same time listen one of the things that douglas did he was not disrespectful he did honor the work that garrison did um but he he said it um one of his claims was that it's common sense that those who suffer injustice are those who must demand redress and thus african-american authors editors and or orators must have their own paper with which to share their voices and i think that's kind of true because because we see that a lot of times and I'm, I'm on Twitter and I just I there's so much I follow quite a few journalists and and and, and, and celebrities and people and writers and it's kind of disheartening to see that you do have people who are pre predominantly white owned publications or you know whether it's a newspaper some article written on some electronic blog site or whatever 
that are speaking to African-American or minority issues, but you don't have any minorities on staff or minorities are in the conversation that contribute to those articles. And so I, I understand where Douglas was coming from when he was when he said what he said, making the claim that he made. There was no shade to the liberator because the liberator was a different voice. They they shared in the same goal of anti-slavery, but it was a completely different voice, a completely different passion, but was the end the result the same absolutely um the north star was four pages long and sold by subscription at the cost of two dollars per year that's nothing i wish i could pay two dollars a year for a publication i love it um they had more than four thousand readers in the united states europe and the west indies the first of its four pages focused on current events having to do with abolitionist issues um there was an occasional feature um forum for Douglas to comment on discrimination in American society. Pages two and three included editorials, letters from readers, readers, articles, poetry, book reviews. And the fourth page was dead, was devoted to advertisements because of course you can't really sell a paper at $2 a year without some type of advertising. Again, there's nothing new under the sun folks. But um, I really just like, like I said, wanted to share um about just the difference in between the liberator and the north star and they bo both had the same focus but different voices focus the focus was the abolishment of slavery one published by a white man in boston one published by of course frederick Douglass in rochester new york same initiatives different voices um again uh the liberator had about three thousand circulation of about three thousand people um, the North Star, 4,000 readers. But again, remember I said, it's not only some, about the subscription and, and circulation so much as it is, how many people are you reaching? You know, and so I think they, you know, you, you kind of had pretty much similarities there as it relates to the, the circulation, how many people they reached um, and different things. Again, different voices, same cause, different voices. And I, I understand, I see the two sides and I agree with Douglas that, you know, the plight of African-Americans, especially as it related to anti-slavery, the passion that will come from someone who is of the same color, experiencing that discrimination, experiencing that horror, experiencing slavery, that's going to communicate differently versus someone who is a Caucasian who's writing it maybe from someone who has experienced it from listening. There's the difference from writing empathetically, you know, and writing passionately from personal experience. You know, uh, there, there, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not always apples to oranges, but it is in this sense, because you're writing on the same issue, just a different voice. And so you reach um, the, the, the heart, you know what I mean? And how, you, how people who read it relate is going to be a little, is going to be different. So, um, to me, I think what made the North Star so much more, to me, promising was that Douglas didn't really make money off of it, but he believed in the content and what he was putting out, you know? So he made money off of his speaking and his engagements and stuff, and he poured it into the newspaper. Um, and so he merged in 1851 with the Liberty Party paper, a newspaper published by the abolitionist Garrett Smith. And that became Frederick Douglass's paper. Um, and so that, I mean, sometimes it is what it is. Finances get really tight. After a while, you can't keep financing something yourself. And by $2, only $2 a year, that was a lot of money. And, um, you know, back then in the 1800s, but also, you know, you want to, you want your, you want to get it out there to people. You want the reach to get out there. And so you, you get creative. So it's not a bad thing to merge with others. Okay. And so it was just really smart. And, um, yeah, so, um, very interesting, very, very interesting. So just a lot of different things. Um, yeah, so just different perspectives, but I think that it was great that, um, you know, there was a lot of content and things that came out of Douglas's paper. But um, there we are, 
the liberator and the north star these are like to me like i said these are some pioneering um abolitionist newspapers that uh, were published in the 1800s that to me have paved the way for african-american journalism a lot of the magazines and stuff that we have today um um i just had this list up and I'm sorry, I just went down. That paved the way. I mean, of course we have Jet and Black Enterprise and um, Essence and Ebony Magazine. We have the Source Vibe Upscale Juicy. Uh, we have the Negro Press. Um, uh, what else do we have? Oh my goodness. Um, so many other, <sighs> so many, um, so many other publications that have since come and gone you know what i mean and so i i find it just um very exciting that um you know all of these different magazines we've had there's the colored american magazine that was the 1900s so now we're getting the 20th century um it was edited by Fred Randolph Moore in eight, from 1857 to 1943. It was founded in 1900, but um, Fred Randolph Moore, the editor, he was born in 1857. So um, a lot of a lot has gone into bringing African Americans into the whole. Uh, publication scene. There's Life Magazine. I bet you many of you didn't even know that Life Magazine was African American was an African American uh, magazine because I sure didn't. I'm gonna be honest. I grew up like Life Magazine had the little, you know, whatever, you know. Look, I just loved that little thing, but I didn't. That, that I just I didn't know until I started looking at it. And so we have the Negro Digest by John Johnson. Um, first issue was 1942. Um, again, Life Magazine, first issue was 1936. Um, I just, I mean, just, just amazing. I mean, you're talking about Life Magazine had, um, pictures from the likes of Gordon Parks. Just, I mean, just Nina Lean and just people that you just give an opportunity to put people on the scene. There was, um, the Colored American Magazine. Uh, I think I talked about this one um, already. Um, we have the root. Um, let's see some others. Uh, the Horizon, a journal of the color line. That was what 1907 to 1910. There's the Black Film Review, the De the Chicago Defender. If you don't know about that, that was from 1905 by Robert Abbott. And um, so, but so many different magazines and things from, you know, our past that we don't know about that's important to today. You know, American Legacy, that was um, uh, a fairly new magazine. But again, all of these old magazines that, but where did they get the opportunity to start? Giving African-Americans a voice in the community. It all started to me with the Liberator and the North Star. You have the right to, you know, journalism. It's, listen, it's in the Constitution. Free press. Free press. And so um, we've had our own press for a long time. We didn't just come on the scene. So, again, how do you learn from the past if you don't know what's in your past. So just sharing with you tonight about African American magazines. But again, I wanted to go back even further and share with you some stuff about the Liberated the North Star, very anti-slavery. And again, um, we say anti-slavery, very abolitionist because we're talking about the 1800s. 1831 was the Liberator and the North Star followed behind. Um, <clears throat> in uh 1847 but uh again same same message anti-slavery of the abolition uh the abolishment of slavery but just different perspectives different points of view different voices but it doesn't mean that you know it's just some trailblazing some opportunities that open the gateway open the doors for so many um of those who are interested in journalism and and have the right to be able to, to contribute to the press. 
So, um, you know, don't ever let your voice be suppressed, okay? That is your constitutional right to free press. Um, but again, knowing what's in your history and what has paved the way and the sacrifices that people made and the risks that they made to bring content out there, to put content out there, it was just phenomenal stuff. So I really hope you guys learned a little something about African Americans in as it relates to journalism and our contribution to journalism that dates all the way back to the 1800s. Have a good night. Bye.